Good morning. Good morning. How y'all this morning? The great news is we have a guest here, and the guest looks remarkably like me, <laughs> but he's a little bit taller, a little bit younger, a lot younger, and devilishly handsome. So y'all, y'all say hi to him this morning. And because this morning, this morning above all mornings, is a wonderful morning to worship God. So let's begin with a call to worship found in your bulletins. Isaiah 40, 31 says, Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Psalm 37, 7 says, Be still before the Lord. And wait patiently for him. We will wait on you, Lord. Psalm 41, 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. We will wait on you, Lord. <coughs> Finally, Lamentations 3.24 says, The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. We will wait on you, Lord. Do you hear a pattern? Let us... Let us sing hymn number 610 for Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Peace of the 
and also with you. Cleaned my car out this morning, and I've got a space that I keep changing. And you know, really, today, you have to wonder, what can you do with change nowadays? Well, one of the good things, when you go to a motel, there's always vending machines. And with those vending machines, you put change in, what pops out? <laughs> You're not helping. You want to tell the story? You put change in, maybe a Hershey bar comes out, maybe a bag of chips, maybe if you're really lucky, an almond joy. But what would happen if you put the change in and you had to wait five minutes, maybe five hours, maybe five days for something to pop out of the machine? That would be pretty disconcerting. But we're going to be talking about waiting today and waiting joyfully because those who wait on the Lord can be joyful if you choose to be. The um, story we're going to be talking about is the fig tree. And I'll be reading you the... Uh, scripture in a minute, but we were told in that little parable to wait. And waiting is never fun, especially if you're waiting for something like an almond joy. So it may not be fun, but we can figure out what to do when we wait because God's timing is always perfect. And if we learn to wait, learn to trust, learn to love, we will be much, much happier. Creative waiting. Can't wait to put these back in my car. <laughs> We begin, and we begin in Isaiah, and it's Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 9, and this tells the story, or one of the stories, of God's gift to the people of Israel. So you can find that on page 588 of most of your pew Bibles. Isaiah says, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the riches of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness of the peoples, a ruler and commander of peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and they will, he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon you. <clears throat> for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. We go now to one of my favorites, Psalm 63 verses 1 to 8. 
and it's on page 489. <laughs> and this psalm is a psalm of David. David, when he was in the desert, he says, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings, I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. And then finally, we go to the story of the fig tree in Luke 13, verses 1 to 9. And that's on page 68. Luke tells this story, and you have to, this is one of those you have to think about. So here now this reading from Luke. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look at it for fruit, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming down to look for fruit on this fig tree and have not found any. Cut it down. Why should you use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the word of the Lord.
and our Redeemer. Amen. Now I happen to know that all of you have heard four-letter words no matter who you are. You are aware that somehow you know that when people say them, they make you feel a little bit better because they've expressed their innermost feelings in a way that people will understand and, of course, take notice. They are freeing because you think they've broken through a barrier. And even though some folks will disapprove, they will get to totally understand how you feel. There are even people who give up saying four-letter words for Lent. They put money in a jar every time it slips out. Talk about paying for your mistakes. Well, I must have gotten it wrong when I titled the sermon. Patience has eight letters. Therefore, it can't be a four-letter word. But when you think about it, P-A-T-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's actually two four-letter words joined together. However, the four-letter words it signifies is one that we avoid like the plague and hate as much as any word. Time. We are an instant society, one that can't waste time. My Apple MacBook takes 10 seconds to boot up. 10 whole seconds. Too long! A baby takes nine months to develop and be born. But each and every first time mom wants that baby to arrive early, like eight and a half months. Nine months is too long. On a TV station, we're told that that station in particular has got an in-state Doppler radar so they can get the weather to you five minutes sooner. So we should watch their station because the other hoi polloi stations take too long. In our story from Luke, the owner has waited too long for the fig tree. He's given it the standard time to produce figs, three years. It's that, that's the prescribed time in Leviticus that a tree will produce. His patience is used up. The tree has taken too long. Cut it down. But the gardener has a better idea. Give this tree some time, some patience, Take some time to see what the tree is about and actually give it the benefit of a doubt. Take a deep, deep breath and wait. There are, there are our four letter words. I find it interesting that this whole story, the one that I read to you, is not resolved. We don't know what happened. The future is left up to the gardener and the God-given abilities of the tree. The whole passage, whether it's about maybe the Galileans, the folks in the temple, maybe it's just about the tree. It talks about time and how short time really is. While we're trying in a hurry to discount time, to some it's an ally, and instead of rushed, it is to be appreciated. From the many true and apocryphal stories about the life of Winston Churchill, comes the report of a singular commencement address. After enduring a lengthy introduction, lengthy, he rose from his seat, he strode to the podium, stared fixedly at this group of graduates, looked them each in the eye, and said, never give up. He then returned to the seat, and waited. He came to the podium again. Never give up. And he returned to the seat.
He did that four or five times with perfect timing. He did it four or five times. Now, terrified that they might respond imp impro improperly, the audience never uttered a squeak as their speaker once again returned. Sure enough, Churchill returned to the podium again and again and yet five times, and each time saying, never give up. At last, feeling like he had exhausted his audience and driven home his point, Churchill did give up and returned to the podium no more. But you can be sure that every graduate in that audience never forgot that speech and never forgot that he or she was to never give up. Has the church forgotten that it has received the same message from God? God has promised never to give up on us. All of the scriptures, Old and New Testaments together are a record of how God never, 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 never gives up. Adam and Eve disobeyed the very first rule, but God never gave up. Abraham wandered and Sarah laughed, but God never gave up. Saul went insane. God never gave up. David plotted against Uriah, but God never gave up. Ahaz sold out to Assyria. God never gave up. Israel fell into pieces. God never gave up. The Jewish people became exiles. God never gave up. Peter denied he ever knew him. God never gave up. The disciples, each and every one of them, ran away. God never gave up. The fig tree didn't produce. God never gave up. What does this have to do with our story? The gardener didn't give up. Even though he seems to have put a time limit in, the gardener never gives up. In the face of disappointment and the lack of instant gratification, God never gives up on us. We, on the other hand, have totally <coughs> turned waiting and time into four-letter words that we think we should avoid with all costs. We think it's a waste of time to wait. But hold on for just a minute. What does the gardener do while he waits? He digs and he fertilizes. He has an action plan. He has something to do while he waits. He gives purpose to the time. Why? Because he thinks the tree has potential and has figured out a method of making the tree come to fruition. But in the midst of waiting, there is an end to the time. Interpretation of this story is wide and varied. It's been thought that the tree might portray Israel and that God was giving it a certain amount of time to get its act together. But I think the obvious interpretation is that the fig tree represents the people of God and the one pleading for more time is Christ. The tree represents not only what we are, but what we are able to become. We can become something different than what we are. And don't get confused that I'm using the plural pronoun because the real meaning of the parable is to represent you all. The story is uniquely and lovingly about each one of us. The thing that strikes me about this allegory is that it's even in the Bible. How much do the owner and the gardener care about the tree? Even in his haste to cut the tree down, the owner even has it in his field of vision. The tree is significant to him. But the real love, the real love of the tree comes from the gardener. The gardener sees the potential and offers to spend his time and work in, in changing it. The gardener sees the potential. 
It wasn't a pleasant job. Our Bible cleans up. The word fertilizes. But that's not actually what is said. It's at some cost that the gardener will work with a tree. It will take time, patience, and the gardener will have to wait. It's worth it to the gardener. It's worth it because he knows what's coming. A harvest of beautiful figs. Figs that can be used for a variety of things. They're regular fruit, it's sweetener. Some figs act as a cure for diseases. Figs are worth the wait to the gardener. As my son says, the juice is worth the squeeze. The gardener never gave up. God loves us so much that he never gives up on us. Yes, the year may be ending, but the gardener is still ready to fertilize and dig. The gardener is not going to give up on us. We may not be producing the best fruit yet, but the year is not up. The gardener is not giving up. We are beautiful to God for what we can become. Many times we don't think of ourselves as the apple of God's eye. We picture ourselves as unproductive fig trees that perhaps should even be cut down. We might even think that we deserve to be cut down. But there's a loving gardener that is just so persistent that he's willing to give his time, willing to give his patience, and willing to wait. I don't know what it is about us that the gardener finds so worthwhile. All I know is that he does. If we are worth so much to a loving gardener, we should be able to see our worth in each other. The gardener loves each and every one of us because we are God's creation. Let us this Lent open our eyes and see each other in the same light that the gardener sees us. Let us revel in the fresh soil and the fertilizer in order to become the fig trees that God intended us to become. Let us know that this time of Lent, we are not limited by our own abilities and shortcomings. We have the greatest gardener in the universe to tend to us and help us to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. How does the gardener fertilize us, you might ask? You're not helping me. How does the gardener fertilize us? Oh, funny you should ask. <laughs> the story comes right out of John 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So, let the master gardener work with you, prune you, and change you. Jimmy Howe and Mike Hogan <coughs> know what good tending does for a crop. It increases it tremendously. The crop isn't choked by weeds. It grows from rich, fertilized soil. And the more the gardener takes care of the crop, the bigger and better it will be. So give yourself some four-letter words. Give yourself time. Give yourself care. Allow God to weed you. Let the master gardener feed you. My English Standard Bible substitutes the word fertilizer for the word that's in the NIV. But we can all carry, we can carry on with that four-letter word theme here. You never know after attention from the gardener, what kind of a crop you'll turn into. Amen. Let us stay seated and say our, our statement of faith, the Apostles' Creed, found in your bulletins. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us stand and sing hymn number 838, Standing on the Promises. so much. We thank you so much for the gift of life, the gift of love, the gift of laughter, and the gift of joy. Lord, let us be joyful in all that we say and all that we do, for it is a reflection of you, and you constantly give us things to be joyful about. Whether it's a baby's cry, a beautiful flower, a day like today. Let us be joyful that you are our God and we can listen, we can talk, and we can love as gifts from you. 
Lord, we thank you so much for all of the things, for family, for friends, for your church. We thank you that we can once again gather together, that we can build on each other, that our faith may become stronger, and that we can love you more as you love us more constantly each and every day. And Lord, today we ask that you bring many people joy. We pray for Jim Hodnett, Bobby Reinhardt. Lord, we pray for Joanne Lewis and Mary Bankhead. We pray for Casey Hoffman, and of course, we always pray for Sadie. We pray for Peggy Montgomery and Margaret Ramsey. We pray for Pat Ramsey. We pray for Don Love. We pray for Olive. We pray for Ricky Meek. We pray for Judy Howe. We pray for Maddie Ruth and Peggy Harshaw. Lord, we pray for Barbara Good and Ellen Green. We say prayers for the McClurkin family. We pray for Vachel Lindsay. We pray for Faye Russell. We pray for Margaret Boyd. And we pray for all the people of Ukraine that they might somehow find your peace. Lord, we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Does anyone have any announcements? Well, I must admit, I am guilty of one more. I am guilty of not using my time constructively. I am guilty of not waiting well. I am guilty because it struck me when I first came into the church today that I had forgotten Yes, I know it's impossible to believe that I had forgotten. But it's true. I had forgotten to bring Easter candy. <laughs> to bring candy that we can put into Easter eggs that we can fill for the kids of Shaywin. That we can, by the simple act, of bringing some candy, we can bring the joy that we just prayed for to the kids in Sharon. So I know Easter's a month away. It feels like it's forever away, but it's not. So I will endeavor to do much better on remembering and on using my time constructively and bringing candy next week. It is my hope that y'all will do the same. And now, let us take our morning offering.
bless these offerings. We ask that you bless them with your grace. We ask that you send them where they need to be sent and to whom they need to be sent. Lord, thank you so much for the being able to give these offerings. Let us receive them in your name. Amen. And I have a note here that says the flowers for next Sunday are for Presley's birthday. She will be three and not one. <laughs> Who and so let us sing hymn number 720, Jesus Calls Us. Oh. 